We're continuing our series through the Gospel of Mark, and this morning, I want you to think about a phrase as we begin this next section in God's life-changing Word. What we see is not often reality. What we see, what we think we see, what we think we understand may not actually be the truth. Now, in a metaphorical way, this is really easy for me to understand because when I was nine years old, I was becoming blind. Not not totally blind, but I remember that I started reading through C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia books and looking up at the fridge, and the, the fridge was fuzzy. And I remember telling my mom and my dad, I can't see very far, you know? When we're at church, the pastor's face is fuzzy. And so they took me to the optometrist And they did some tests on my eyes, you know, and they figured out that I was severely nearsighted like my mother. (laughs) And they got me this giant pair of glasses, and you're going to love this right there, (laughs) aviator glasses. These were cool back then and a long time ago. At nine years old, I put on my big aviator glasses, and I walked out of the optometrist's office, and my mom and dad said, so what does it look like? What can you see? And I said, the, the trees, they're not green blobs anymore, Mom. I can see the leaves. It was suddenly clear. I thought I could see, but what I saw was not really reality. And suddenly I could see everything clearly. Everything I could see crisp, and I could see life as it's intended to be seen. Now, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine that I already mentioned during my little talk about India. His name is Luther. Luther and I met at Dallas Theological Seminary. He was working on his PhD in Old Testament. He's one of those really smart guys. And and so I was walking out of the elevator at the Swiss Tower where married students lived, and I saw that he looked like he was from India, and I said, hey, are you from India? And he said, yeah, and I found out he was a Telugu-speaking Indian man, and he actually lived in the same state where I had gone to India. So we struck up this conversation, and Luther and I became friends, and then we especially became friends when he and his wife invited Stephanie and I over for dinner in their apartment. She made this amazing buffet of Indian food that was really spicy but really good. And uh, Stephanie was pregnant at the time, so she had to watch it with the spicy food, but it still tasted good. And Luther and his wife, they were making their way through school, and I remember hearing how things were going, and, and he was doing really well in his studies, but he and his wife were struggling because his wife is a doctor. She's an OBGYN and has sur- surgical certifications. And she was unable to practice in the U.S. She had a hard time working her way into the system. She was una- unable to work. And she was unable then to, uh, to stay busy at all, and she became depressed and disillusioned. And so Luther was doing really good in his school, but his wife over here was struggling, struggling emotionally, struggling spiritually, and they were struggling as husband and wife. As time went on, she decided that she needed to go back to India. If she didn't go back to India, she could lose her credentials, and so she, she went back And Luther stayed for a little while, which made things actually worse. It was really hard for Luther and his sweet wife. And so he came to this place between a a cliff and another cliff, and he realized he had to make a decision. And so Luther quit his studies. He finished all of his coursework. And if you know anything about a PhD and anything about a PhD at a place like Dallas, it's really intense. You have to learn French and German and Latin just to get started, besides already knowing Greek and Hebrew. And he finished all of that work. He finished all of the class time, and all he had left was his dissertation, which normally takes another couple years. But he quit studies and went back to India, and he felt like he was leaving his future behind. His professors were really depressed. They're like, Luther, you have such potential Your article that you just wrote is being published by the Evangelical Theological Society, and they want to come have you lecture here and lecture here. And he left it all and went back home to India to be with his wife. He thought he saw God's plan really clearly. He thought he saw what it meant to follow Jesus on his mission. And and now at this place, he, he couldn't understand, what does this mean? Is this what it means to follow you, Jesus? That I, I may t- take all these steps, 
Go through all this education, not only in India, then get accepted in the school in the United States, and then leave it all at the point of finishing within a couple years. And my marriage on the rocks, my family struggling, my parents back home in India not understanding, all these people and all these hopes and all this stuff seem to be dashed on the rocks. What's going on, Lord? Sometimes we don't understand. We think we see, but we don't see clearly. We all fall into this place in our walk with Jesus. We think, you know, I've been trusting Christ since I was five years old. That was 31 years ago for me. For many of you, that was a lot longer ago. For some of you, you've been following Jesus for five or 10 or 15 years, and you think, okay, I've trusted Christ. I've done the right things. I think now if I behave right and I follow Jesus according to his way, that my life should go pretty well. That things shouldn't go really all that difficult. And God's great favor should just rest on my life and I'll be blessed with a big house and a great job and a beautiful wife and everything will go smooth and I won't have problems with my kids and my school will go fine and the plans that I think God has for me that I've arranged on my list will go right. You've never thought like that, have you? I have like hundreds of times. And I think I see the mission of Jesus clearly for my life, and it turns out to not be reality. We skew Jesus. We think that if we're doing things according to his way, then the way that we want life to go is going to go right for us. It's going to go smoothly. It's not a path of suffering, but a path of ease and smooth pavement, no potholes. What we see is not often reality. Luther struggled with that. I've struggled with that. If you struggle with that, you can say, amen, Pastor Michael, right? And the question I have for you today simply is this, who is Jesus to you in that moment when the bottom falls out, when you don't get that scholarship at college, when you don't pass that class, or when that exam doesn't go the way you think it should go, when you don't get accepted into that school, or when you don't get that job that you applied for, or when your marriage is struggling, or when your kids aren't cooperating, or when things just unravel or maybe from a pastoral perspective, you think, I've been faithfully teaching the Word of God, and that church down the street that's proclaiming a prosperity gospel, name it, claim it, health and wealth, they're growing and we're not. What's going on, Lord? In that moment, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to me? What does it mean to see the Messiah's mission clearly? What does it mean to follow the Messiah's mission, to really understand it? So in the Gospel of Mark chapter 8, starting in verses 22 and following, we're going to see the disciples wrestling with this question, but it begins with this two-stage miracle. Jesus heals a man born blind, but he does it in two stages, and it's this surprising incident. We go, why, why is this happening? And this two-stage healing is on purpose it's intentional. Everything that Jesus said was intentional to drive home a point, and he is going to drive home a point through a series of questions to his disciples in the next scene, and it's going to parallel this two-stage healing of this man in Bethsaida. And the disciples are, are wondering, what does it really mean? They, they think they see clearly what it means to follow Jesus, they think they see, but they trip over the, themselves continually. Jesus asks them. It sounds like they get the question right, the answer correct, but then they trip over themselves again. And so Jesus is going to press them with this question, and the text presses us with this question. When facing challenges in life, when facing uncertain circumstances, when facing a plan that unravels, who is Jesus to you and what does it mean to really follow the Messiah's mission? So listen carefully. In fact, let's stand in honor of God's Word as I read verses 22 through 26. Listen carefully to this. It says, And they came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to Jesus, and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village. And after spitting on his hands and laying his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? Look back at verse 21 for a moment. Jesus had already asked him a hinge question, and he was saying to them, that is continually pressing them with the question, do you not yet understand? And then to the question to the blind man, do you see anything? And he looked up and he said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. 
It's like me when I was nine years old. Green blobs, okay? It's fuzzy, blurry vision. And then again, he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and was restored and he began to see everything clearly. Don't miss that. And he sent him to his home and saying, do not even enter the village. You may be seated. We give thanks to the Lord for his word. And so the man was blind. Then the man begins to see, but it's blurry vision. And then the man sees and he sees everything clearly. What's that all about? Why would Jesus do that? Well, then now we find the disciples and Jesus 25 miles further north from Jerusalem, all the way to this place called Caesarea Philippi, a a town named after Caesar. It's the farthest they've gone away from Jerusalem at this point in their journey following Jesus. And you can feel this pull if you, if you felt the heartbeat of the disciples all the way through the gospel mark up to this point. You would feel this pull that they want Jesus down to Jerusalem because they want him to rout out the Romans, to take away their oppressors, and to take the throne and to rule as king, as the Messiah. Right now, that's what the disciples want. But he's taking them further away. And he's doing that intentionally because he wants them to wrestle with a question. And sometimes Jesus is going to take you and me further away, further and further away from where we want to go. Further and further away from where we expect him to work. Or where we expect him to solve a problem to have us wrestle with who he really is. Have you ever experienced that before? To test, to teach us a lesson. And so it says this, Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, who do people say that I am? Who do the crowds say that I am? The people out there, the masses, what's the word? And so the disciples respond, they told him in verse 28, saying, John the Baptist And others say, Elijah, but others, one of the prophets. They're blind. The crowds are blind. The people, they signify, listen carefully, the man blind in Bethsaida. They don't see the identity of Jesus Christ at all. Spiritual blindness is seeing Jesus as anything less than the Messiah, Spiritual blindness is seeing Jesus as less than the Messiah. Anything you want to put in that category, anything less than the Messiah, any person less than the Messiah, that's spiritual blindness. And sight is always paralleled throughout the Gospels with spiritual understanding or spiritual misunderstanding, whether you're blind or blurry or you see. And the crowds out there are blind. They'd see Jesus as maybe one of the prophets, maybe as a teacher, maybe as John the Baptist, but not as the Christos, not as the anointed one from God not as the rescuer, redeemer. And that's the state you and I were all born into. We were all born blind. We were all born blind, even dead in our transgressions and our sins. Yesterday, our power flickered, and then it went out. It was only 9.30 in the morning, and I thought, "Uh uh-oh, the storm hasn't even started yet. And of course, our kids went into panic mode within 30 seconds you would have thought we were on the prairie in a cabin with no electricity and a pump outside and, a, you know, and a, not a porta potty but a little shed out back, you know, because Hudson's like, oh, man, what's happening? What's Laura Ingalls Wilder life for a little while? Hudson, you know, and Everlyn, right? Right, Everlyn? Yeah, she nodded. Okay. And so, <laughs> the power went out. Of course, it was daytime, so we still had light coming through the window, but it reminded me of a moment when I was in Glacier National Park as a chaplain in 2007, and the power went out at night. And we were in this desolate place in that beautiful wilderness, but it was a cloudy night, no stars, you couldn't see the moon. It was dark, overcast, and the power clicked out, and we were trying to finish up the night of serving in this little restaurant, and everything went into chaos mode. And so I ran back to my little, my little apartment and grabbed a headlamp because it was just nuts. The restaurant was nuts. People were crashing in everybody, food, plates everywhere. It was, it was absolutely insane. And, and so I ran home, got my little headlamp, 
And I tripped over a log, and I thought I just I skidded right to the ground actually on this little trail because I didn't see the log on the. I knew it was there, but I didn't know it was there because it was dark. You know, I'm like that was there, but I didn't see it there this time. Just crashed to the ground, and I thought in that moment, you know, in that place, I was surrounded by people who were spiritually blind. I had many discussions with people, and they were questioning me about what I believed, and they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. They believed Jesus was merely a man, just a teacher, you know? Maybe he had some good moral things to say. Maybe if you follow his teachings, your life might look good, you know? You might be nicer, kinder to people. And I thought, you know, this is where we all once were, and this is where they are. They're, they're blind in the dark groping around in the darkness, trying to find their way, trying to find a light bulb somewhere to guide them through life. That's the crowds during Jesus' time, and that's still the way in which we're all born into this blindness. And maybe some of you here this morning, you came in, and remarkably so, because it was icy and slippery out there, but you decided to come to church today because there's some nudge in your heart, and, and the Holy Spirit's working on you right now and you realize that you're blind, you haven't really seen the identity of Jesus Christ and received His life, I want you to think about that. Ponder, do you see? The next stage, though, is going to build in this story. Look with me in verse 29. So, the first step simply is this. Spiritual blindness is seeing Jesus as less than the Messiah. But the next part, verse 29, He continued by questioning them, but who do you say that I am? And the way this is constructed in the Greek puts the, puts the emphatic force at the beginning. You. It's like this. You know, almost like he's pointing the finger, but you. I know what the people are saying, all right? But you, who do you say that I am? How do you respond to the questions of people around you? How do you describe me, Jesus is asking? What kind of descriptors? What kind of definition? And so Peter, as the spokesman for the group, he was always one ready to quick jump answer. Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Is that the right answer? Sounds like it, right? The right word. In the Greek, Christos means Messiah, anointed one. You are the Christ. But then Jesus said, Jesus warned them, verse 30, and he warned them to tell no one about him. Why would he do that? Because the disciples, even though it seems like they have the right answer, they only have blurry vision, like the man who is not fully restored in his sight. Partial sight. How do I know that? Look with me in verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, that is himself, Jesus the Christ, that word is used in Daniel chapter 7, that he is the Son of Man sent from the ancient of days to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And as Jesus explained all of this, my my belief is that they didn't hear the last part because they hear suffering, rejection, death. No, 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 that's not part of the plan. All right, Jesus, I know we're up in Caesarea Philippi, way far north from Jerusalem, in a place occupied by the Romans, but this is not in our plan. This is bad PR. The crowds are not going to come to you, Jesus, if you start talking about suffering and being rejected and being killed. And all the religious people, all the important people doing that to you, Jesus, this isn't the way that we're going to, this isn't what we talked about. Is it what we talked about? Can you imagine the scene? That's exactly what Peter starts into. He says after three days he's going to rise again, but what he lays out as the mission of the Messiah doesn't align with what they see what they think, what they understand to be the Messiah's mission. It doesn't fit the mold. They want somebody to come in and take out their problems, take out their oppressors immediately. Blurriness, spiritual blurriness is seeing Jesus as only, listen carefully, only a present earthly Savior. We want a rescuer now. We want our problems taken away now. We want to be healed now don't we? We want easy now. We want comfort now. The disciples aren't all that different than us, are they? Come, Jesus, take care of this now. 
Does it, is, isn't that what it means to follow you? Look at verse 32. And he was stating the matter plainly. Another way to translate that with a synonym would be clearly. So they can't miss it. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed by all the people that all the people think are important. What? And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. The very man who just called Jesus the Christ is rebuking Christ? What? Because <laughs> he doesn't see clearly. It's like how I see you right now, blurry. I see my grandma's gray hair. That's about it. <laughs> blurry. Can't read the words on the screen. I think you're all smiling right now, but I don't know. Oh, no, you're not smiling. Okay. <laughs> Blurry vision. And the disciples think they've got the right answer. Peter rebukes him because he has not clearly seen. Look at verse 33. But turning around and seeing his disciples, so he brings them all into this. He rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. It's even a satanic belief that if we believe that Jesus has, has come to take all our problems away right now, to make life easy and comfortable, to do our bidding, that if we have enough faith, He'll just do as we please, that's setting our mind on ourselves and what we want in our interests and the betterment of our life rather than God's glory and what He wants and His desire and His plan. And this comes really close to home in my heart in my life. Because all too often, don't we want things to go our way? And when they don't, we question God and shake our fists and wonder and almost rebuke Him, don't we? Why aren't you doing this, God? I thought this was supposed to be the way your mission goes. Like when we have miscarriages, six of them. Why is this happening, Lord? Why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this? any number of way to try to answer that question. Or during my first trip to India, contracting some virus that affects my larynx and my vocal nerves and my voice stops working for months on end and wrestling with that. I'll tell you that story some other day. Right? When you don't have enough money in the bank account to buy food for your children, when any a number of other things unravel in your life, who is Jesus to you? Do you see clearly? Do I see clearly? That's what Luther, my friend, struggled with. He couldn't figure it out. I mean, he knew all the right answers. He had all kinds of theological education. He knows the Bible better than I do, better than all of you. He knows it very well. He's heard it from his childhood. He almost finished a PhD in theology, in the Bible. But he wrestled. What does it really mean? follow the mission of the Messiah. He was filled with disillusionment, despondency, and depression, he told me. He returned home to India, and he and his wife had struggled so much over this that uh, they weren't together for a number of months. She went to work at a little government hospital, and he just didn't know what to do with his life, and he wondered, what, what, what are you all about? For some of you in that point in your life, have you been there wondering, what are you doing, Jesus? Why are you bringing this? Maybe we don't see clearly, but then here Jesus makes it clear. Look at verse 34, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples, everybody together now, wants to make sure they all get it. And he said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This mirrors the, the suffering, the rejection, and the death. This is the total package of dying to self. That Jesus is calling everybody, if you want to follow me, which is another way of saying, be my disciple. If you want to be his disciple, if you want to follow Jesus, then you have to die to self. 
face suffering, face rejection, and face death to all of your own ambitions for the sake of His glory and His agenda. Rather than your ambition, you work for His glory, His fame, His name, not your own, not your comfort, not your ease, but His glory. And you take up your cross and you follow Him all the way to the cross. Francis Schaeffer has this little book on the spiritual life, True Spirituality. And he said, if you want to become like Jesus, if you want to come after him, which is the call of every person who's put their trust into Christ, if you want to come after him and to be conformed to his image, then he calls you to walk the same path he took, which is one of suffering, rejection, even death to yourself. And in that, you find an abundant life. You find the joy of walking in the life of Christ. This is not great PR to the people, to the crowds. They would not have understood it, though some would. But he's calling them and he's calling us, if you want to find true life, lose your life. It's that blunt. It's that blunt. You want to have real life, abundant life, lose your life. Now, the path of Christ that he took is the path for your life and my life. to deny ourselves, take up the cross, to follow Him all the way. We're born blind. We come to see Jesus as the Messiah, but so often we still wrestle with blurry vision. We do not clearly see, but clear sight is seeing Jesus not as a present earthly Savior, but as the Savior, the Messiah, the true Messiah, whose path is one of suffering before glory. And he calls all who would come after him, that is to walk in his sandal steps, to walk in his trail. He calls all of us to this path of suffering before glory too. No exceptions. No cop-outs. All of us. That the way to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus and the way to experience true life is by losing your life for Christ. <laughs> That's what it means to see clearly the Messiah's mission. And it's amazing how he works redemption when you do that, when you walk in his footsteps. He opens up new ways that you've never seen before. Paul David Tripp, he said, God will take you where you would never choose to go for the disciples, that was Caesarea Philippi. For you, that may be way off the, the path that you had for yourself. It may be a different vocation, a different career, different line of life. God will take, take you where you would never choose to go, to go in order to produce in you what you can never achieve on your own. A faith that you never had in and of yourself. A faith in Him to follow Him all the way to the cross no matter the cost. Here's another step further, the way that I've paraphrased it. Jesus will take you and I where we would never choose to go in order to open up our eyes to what we can never see on our own. That is to clearly see the path of the Messiah. And Luther, my friend, he went back to India depressed, despondent, but then as he just dropped to his knees in submission to the mission of Jesus Christ, God gave him an idea. There's his sweet wife working outside of the hospital there. He didn't know what he'd do, but then God gave him an idea. With his wife working at this little government hospital, making one-tenth of the amount what she could make if she worked in a private hospital, ministering to the poorest of the poor in their little village, God gave Luther an idea of starting a TV station. And he called it Suvarta, which in Telugu just means good news. And so he called it Suvarta TV. And we were sitting with him, and we said, have you ever had any experience with TV or media? He said, nope, not at all. Dan and Lois and I are like, really? Wow. Yeah, I just, you know, had this idea. And, and so I talked with some people, and we got it started. Only nine years ago, he started this. A year after he returned to India, with no path in sight, he couldn't see, and then God opened up a way he couldn't see on his own, and, and, and his sight opened up to what Jesus had for him, even though he had let all this other stuff aside, he had to let it go, die to self, in order to truly live out the life that Christ had for him. Suvartha TV went from one little branch 
to three branches, three TV stations, reaching 10 million people a day in three years. Can you imagine that? And we sat there in this TV station. Here's a picture of us. Look at that, the green screen. And every day, all across this area, people are hearing the Suvarta, the good news in Telugu, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, It's reaching millions of people every single day. We traveled four hours away to that other town where the wedding was held. Remember that? To this place called Kakanada. You know, people in India said, where is that? Because they don't even know where it is. And we were in this hotel, and and we said, you know, we were here for a wedding, but then we were also in Vijuada. They said, what are you doing in Vijuada? And we had to be kind of guarded about what we were saying with people, but it turned out the host at this hotel was a believer and we said, well, we were with the Chatlas in Vijawada. They have a TV station. He said, is it Suvartha TV? We're like, that's a very, the very famous Christian TV station in India, Suvartha TV. And then his, his, uh, his colleague, our waiter, he came over. This young man was a Hindu. And he said, oh, I've heard of Suvartha TV. That's a very famous Christian TV station. And we were four hours away in a place forsaken where people from India don't even know where it is. And they've watched the gospel because Luther and his team, just two young guys, are spreading the good news all around Southeast India. (laughs) Hallelujah. But he had to die to self. God took him where he would never choose to go in order to produce in him what he could never achieve on his own, to open up his eyes to what he could never see on his own. And God wants to do that in your life too. But it doesn't come through the path you think it will come take. It's suffering. It's, it's hard. It's rejection. It's dying to self. But that's how you find the true life. So, Jesus continues with explanatory clauses here. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. You lose your life, you find life. That's the call of the gospel. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in glory, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus is calling us to a different path, a path of suffering before glory. This is anti-prosperity gospel because it's the true gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't say, come and get whatever you want. It says, come and die. (laughs) And then you'll find life and the truest joy that is ever experienced for all humanity. You can find life, joy, following Jesus Christ. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? You maybe even bow your knees with me for a moment. And in this moment... Lay out before God your, your misunderstandings, the blurry vision that we all still struggle with, that the disciples will continue to struggle with for several more chapters in this gospel. But they will see clearly because they will see the risen Christ. And if you've seen the risen Christ, you know there's suffering and there's glory, there's hope, there's life, a life lived for Him is the most satisfying, rewarding life you can live. A life that does not mean perfect comfort and ease. It means denying yourself, taking up the cross and following Him all the way to the cross. And then in the death to yourself, you find the true life in Him. So let's talk to God for a moment. Oh, Father in heaven, we praise You. We thank You, oh God, for Your Word. Thank You, Lord, for the testimony of your gospel that we've seen in India in an amazing way. Lord, we pray that the testimony, the gospel would be seen in our lives to the praise of your glory, that your power would be shown in our lives in an amazing way. That's what we pray, oh God. May today we submit. May we bow. May we die to self, deny ourselves so that the cross of Christ We'd embrace it, that we'd embrace present suffering for your future glory through our lives today and tomorrow and for every day that you give us on this earth in the matchless, 
powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all the redeemed said, amen. Would you stand and let's close. And